Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I have the Executive Vice President of Advocacy and Healthcare Access with me today. Her name is Barry Talenti. Barry leads teams who leverage public policies to find solutions for people with MS, engage healthcare providers and others in the healthcare space, and work towards people affected by MS having access to the high quality healthcare they need. Barry also leads the society's work to increase affordability and access to MS medications. On today's episode, we talk about changes to healthcare policies for MS and what to keep an eye out for that could increase access and equity to healthcare. Barry, thank you so much for being here with me today. Thanks, Gretchen. I'm so glad to be here. Of course. Right before I pressed record, we were just talking about how we've been talking about doing this podcast episode together for so long. And so it's nice to finally get it going. Absolutely. Yeah. And so we're going to dive into lots of things related to healthcare and access to healthcare and medications. But before we do, I always like to ask my guests a question from my interview deck to allow us to get to know you a little outside of your area of expertise. Is it okay if I ask you a question? Yeah, let's have it. All right. I'm going to shuffle. Your question is, if you were given $1,000 to spend on your closest friend, what would you get them? I would get an experience. So something Mm. that we could do together. So I just, with some of my high school friends, we just got tickets to go see Cindy Lauper in Boston in the fall. So something that sort of brings us back to, you know, our friendship and makes us laugh and have a good time and gives us those memories to hold on to. I love that. That's such a good answer. I remember it brings me back to when my sister had her baby. It was during COVID. And so it was a virtual baby shower. And I remember someone giving me the advice that the gift that I should give my nephew was experience gifts instead of like actual things. Absolutely. So my teenagers and their cousin right now are away on a baseball trip with their uncle. And so they're teens, they don't need anything or what they want is really expensive. And so their (laughs) uncle started doing these baseball trips with them over the last couple of years. So that's really fun. That's awesome. Very cool. All right. So let's go ahead and dive in. And before I get to my questions, can you share a bit about who you are and what you do? Yeah, I would love to. So everyone knows now my name is Barry and I work at the National Multiple Sclerosis Society. And in my role there, I oversee both of our advocacy and our healthcare access work. And so what that really means is that the teams I work with and I are focused on how do we change policies, whether they're government policies or policies within the healthcare system, to make sure that people with MS can get what they need so that they can get access to affordable comprehensive quality healthcare and other government services and resources that may support them along their best journey with MS. That sounds like it would be a very challenging, but also rewarding job. Do you find both ends of the spectrum (laughs) with that? It definitely is both. I mean, there's some patience and persistence and maybe a little banging your head on the desk at times and things like that. But yeah, when it works and and something changes and you hear from people with a mask that they can get what they need and their journey is a little bit better, that's hugely influential. That's awesome. And I do have lots of questions about access to healthcare and whatnot. But before I ask those, I just want to ask a different question. So I, one of the things that we first connected on was over on LinkedIn and you had shared a post that you had just been to the White House and I believe it was for celebrating disability rights. Is that right? Yes, probably. So I've been fortunate to have been to the White House just under a handful of times in the last few years. And, uh, you know, I get to go, but it's really based on all of our MS activists across the country that are helping to move legislation and policies forward. And so the least I can do is share pictures back out with the MS community and let them see that. 
but I think we were celebrating some things for disability rights. And a few of the other times we were celebrating passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, which is just about to hit its two-year anniversary. Oh, wow. What do we need to know about that? Well, there's a lot. And I think, um, you know, a lot of laws feel really big and it's hard to know how they impact us on a day-to-day. And so I'm grateful that we can have this conversation. So there's a few key things that are coming up in the Inflation Reduction Act. And so this law, part of its focus was really changing the Medicare prescription drug benefit for people, for all people, but who are on Medicare, but it's really impactful for people who rely on expensive medications like people with MS tend to do. And so coming up in January, 2025, so all, once we hit January of 2025, people who have Medicare will and take an outpatient prescription drug. So it's important to remember it's that outpatient prescription drug part but will not have to pay more than $2,000 a year for all of their outpatient prescription drugs. And they'll also have the opportunity to be able to spread those costs throughout the year through something called the Medicare Prescription Payment Plan, which has gone through a few different names, but I think that's where we are. And so the important thing for people listening to know is if you're on Medicare or you know someone on Medicare and they tend to have expensive medications, that it's really important to take advantage of the open enrollment cycle for Medicare this fall. And so it's really important to sort of make a list of all of the medications that you take, really go into the plan finder, make sure you know what plans are covering your medications, what it will be, and know that it will be capped at $2,000 for all of your outpatient prescription drugs. So I keep emphasizing that outpatient part because we know a lot of people with MS take infused medications. Unfortunately, those are under a different part of Medicare, so they're not susceptible to that $2,000 out-of-pocket cap. But whether you're in traditional Medicare prescription drug plan or Medicare Advantage, really make sure you're sort of documenting those outpatient prescription medications that you have. And really, it's a, it's a great opportunity to find a plan that may work better for you because you can look at all aspects of the plan and not just focus on what may have the least expensive options for your medications. Wow. And so for outpatient medications, is that any medication that's not infused or are there are some exclusions there? Nope. It's any medication that's not infused. And so, you know, we tend to emphasize the disease modifying treatments in MS, but it's really any medication. And we know that people with MS will take a number of symptom management medications. And of course, we're all humans. So we have other health conditions as well. And so any medication that you take, that's that outpatient medication. So you think you pick it up at the pharmacy, maybe specialty pharmacy, mails it to your house, but it's not infused. It's not an IV type medication. So sort of document all of those and you won't pay more than $2,000 out of pocket in the coming year. So it's super exciting. And there's been studies done previously that people with MS would spend as much as $7,000 out of pocket just for their MS disease modifying treatment. So the change based on this law really has the impact to completely change the lives of so many people with MS. Yeah. I w- my next question is going to be, how much would someone spend which is, of course, different for each person, but if they weren't enrolled. So around 7,000, that's what what you found? Just for their disease-modifying treatment. Yeah, not not including the symptom management ones or everything else. Exactly. Whoa, that's a a huge difference. Yes, it can be really really life-changing for so many people. Yeah. How long has this been in the works to get to this point? I mean, years and years, but, uh, you know, things in the legislative space go fast and slow all at the same time. So, uh, you know, I think this idea about capping the out-of-pocket caps in Medicare has been around for a really long time. And it's expensive to do, too. And so that's been sort of some of the holdup. But, uh, you know, there's really been recognition that, you know, when the prescription drug benefit came, first came into effect and was designed. There were some funky things in the design. Medications today are a lot more expensive than they were. 
when the prescription drug law was first enacted. And so we, we knew that changes needed to happen. And, you know, so many MS activists, along with others, really were vulnerable and open and sharing their experiences and letting Congress know why this change was so important. And, and then it all sort of got wrapped up with some other important changes to healthcare and then some other things as well in the Inflation Reduction Act. And so, yeah, we get to celebrate two years of the Inflation Reduction Act and then some really important provisions for people with MS. And what about people who don't have Medicare? Is there anything similar, which obviously there's lots of different types of insurances and companies and whatnot, but is there anything similar to this? It's a little bit more complicated with private insurance, which other people may have, and Medicaid has some of its own things. But, you know, there have been provisions since the Affordable Care Act that help to bring, it's a higher, but help to bring an out-of-pocket cap that people have in private insurance that we just hadn't seen in Medicare. And so it's it's a little harder for Congress to legislate private insurance because it can be regulated at the federal level, it can be regulated at the state level, there are private companies, there's a lot of other things. But we also know that a lot of times we'll see private insurance follow the trends of Medicare. And so anytime we can make changes happen in Medicare, that's a good thing because you can see a ripple effect from there as well. Yeah, good place to start. Awesome. So I feel like you have a really unique perspective because you're able to see the side of things from the patients with multiple sclerosis, but also from a healthcare standpoint. And so it's nice to see both sides. From your perspective, this new act and the provision sounds like a huge step in the right direction. Is that what you're seeing across the board? Do you have high hopes for what's happening with healthcare these days and access to healthcare and health equality? Or is there still a long way to go? Kind of paint the picture for us. (laughs) I don't know that we have enough time for that, Gretchen, (laughs) but I think there's good things. And then there's lots of, we'll say, opportunities ahead. So I think we've made a lot of progress across the board and people being able to have more affordable access to medications. And it, and it is, I get to hear the perspectives of people with MS. I get to hear their perspectives of healthcare providers and, you know, using what we've been talking about as an example, uh, you know, one way it just changes that dynamic between a healthcare professional and a person with MS is they, they do now really get to focus in on that shared decision-making of what medication is right for that individual with MS, you know, Right now, what we hear a lot is there's sort of that, that conversation about what the, might, the right medication might be, and then that leads right into the conversation of, well, are, is this person going to get access through their insurance, right? Is insurance going to need to give permission through prior authorization, or does the person need to try a different medication first, which is called step therapy, and then, you know, getting to what we've been talking about even if this person can get the medication through their insurance, will they be able to afford the out-of-pocket costs? And so mm-hmm. it's really sort of opening up that dynamic between the person with MS and their healthcare provider, again, to just focus in on what's the right medication without some of that other noise that sometimes gets in the way of good care. And so, you know, there are those other things out there like prior authorization and step therapy that we've been working on at the state level and at the federal level, there's certainly some access issues overall in terms of equity. So the society is also working on an initiative really looking at where there's a lack of neurologists and MS specialists and what can we do to help open that up and ensure that people with MS get access to a quality quality care and a healthcare provider who's knowledgeable about MS, no matter where they live, because that's so important. We want to make sure that every single person with MS has the same access as the next person with MS. And so the healthcare system in the U.S. is complicated and, you know, we're not going to get there overnight, but we keep working to make sure that people with MS can get what they need. Yeah. I was just working with someone who lives in Australia who has MS 
And it's a whole different world over there. Yeah. They, she was saying they have like a certain amount of money and it's a good, good amount of money that they can spend on whatever they want as long as it's related to their health care. It could be medications. It could be online programs. It could be anything and just doesn't work that way here, unfortunately. Nope. It's very different here. Yeah. Do you think we'd ever get to that point? <laughs> <laughs> No. <laughs> I mean, I think I think there are some things in our healthcare system that are trying that. There's sort of little pockets, you know, Medicare Advantage plans have that aspect in mind where it's a little more flexible of what your insurance will pay for. So, you know, depending on the plan, maybe it will pay for transportation for you to get to a healthcare provider. Right? But you have to sort of have that almost closed type health insurance, like a Medicare Advantage plan where they're covering everything to get mm-hmm. to that. But there are some health insurers that are looking a little bit differently and looking at some of these innovative ideas. You know, right. I think overall with the in the US health system, we're still trying to make that transition from prioritizing and paying for sick care to prioritizing and paying for wellness and preventive care. So when it comes to access, do you feel like it's more so access in terms of getting more people trained, like more MS specialized neurologists and physical therapists and whatnot? Or is it more so things like telehealth that can allow people with MS to access these professionals that already exist? Or is it a mix of both? Yeah. Yes to all of it. (laughs) And I think, right, there's, I mean, there's a well-documented neurologist shortage, but to your point, people with MS see lots of different types of healthcare professionals too. And we know that physical therapy is important, occupational therapy, speech, mental health is incredibly important and getting a mental health provider for people with MS. And there may be lots of other types of providers that people with MS see. And, you know, healthcare here is a business too. And so in some areas, it, it would be really difficult to think that there's Uh, MS specialist or even a physical therapy who's really a physical therapist who's really knowledgeable about MS because they just wouldn't have the volume of business of people with MS. And so we look at it from all angles. Like, yes, the society is funding new clinical fellows every year to bring in more MS specialists, but we're also, we're advocating for telehealth at the federal and state levels. So that remains an option for people. We're looking at the at lots of other things too. We're looking at how can we offer training and education to non-specialist providers. So even if their entire practice is an MS, they have they're building up their knowledge base, and so they can effectively treat and care for people with MS along with other people they may serve. That would be amazing. Is there a place? online that the National MS Society has where people can find MS specialists in different areas like neurologists, speech and language, physical therapy, et cetera? Yes, we do. On the National MS Society website, which is nationalmssociety.org, we have what we call our Find Doctors and Resources tool. So people can find that right on our website and sort of put in their location, the type of provider they're looking for, It's not an all-inclusive list. It is what we know working with the vendor that we do. But the society also works closely with a lot of different providers who have sort of raised their hand and said, I want to work with people with MS and I've gained more knowledge and experience. And we call that group of providers partners in MS care. And so if someone's a designated partner in MS care, that's going to be indicated on the website as well. So Someone with MS who's looking can say, okay, maybe this provider knows a little bit more about MS and that might be a good place to start. That's awesome. That's really important because there are so few and far between. I became an MS specialist, gosh, what year was it? Let's see, maybe 2016. And at the time, I remember hearing that there were only about three of us in all of the state of Massachusetts that were MS specialists, which there's probably some that we just didn't know existed, but regardless, so few of us that 
is crazy. I had people coming to me from about two hours away for their physical therapy session because I was the closest person that they could find. And then you add on MS symptoms on top of that, like just the fatigue to get dressed, get out of your house, drive two hours, and then repeat the whole thing on the way home. Right. I mean, so many people with MS have shared that just navigating the healthcare system is like having another full-time job. And so, you know, that's really why I do what I do. And our teams are so focused on finding ways that we can improve the healthcare experience and the healthcare system for people with MS. So, uh, you know, imagine if someone had to do two hours each way to any type of healthcare provider they need to see. And it's, you know, it's worth it to find someone who's knowledgeable about what you're going through and experiencing, but it's not, it's not the right experience that people need to have. Yeah. Is there anything that we can do or that the the people who are experiencing these um, difficulties accessing providers or medications, is there anything that we can do on our end to help these processes get pushed along or start new ones? What is, what's the process for that? Yeah, such a great question, Gretchen. So, uh, you know, part of what we focus on in our advocacy work at the society is raising the voices of people affected by MS and amplifying and really highlighting that experience. And so anyone who's interested in sort of joining us and working to change policies can um, sign up to be an MS activist. So that's a great first step. And that also can be done right through the National MS Society website. And when you do that, you'll get information and a monthly newsletter. You'll receive what we call action alerts, which let you know when there's a policy opportunity in your area. It might be with Congress at the federal level, it might be in your state, and and it lets you join in and raise your voice. And it's super easy. You get an email sent to you and you just click the button and respond to the email. And then the really important part is that you personalize the template message that you get because that's really what catches the attention of the elected official and lets them know that, you know, in this day and age that they're talking to a real person because it's a personalized experience and not just, you know, an AI or automated tool. And that also lets us on the back end see your story too. And that lets us really see, okay, this person Gretchen really has a direct experience with this policy issue that we're talking about. Let's call Gretchen up and find out a little bit more and see, maybe we can use her story in a news article too, or we can make sure to share it more broadly with elected officials. And it just really is a way for anyone to get involved, anyone to really find a way to turn what they're experiencing into action and to join the collective MS movement and, and make change happen. Wow. That's awesome. It's, it's nice that it's so simple and that you even provide information for your specific area. That's really cool. Yeah. Wow. Are there other policies that we should be on the lookout for? I know you mentioned this one that's coming up by that you have to enroll by the end of this year for the cap. Is there anything else that's in the works or that we should just kind of keep our eyes and ears open for? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, you may have heard we're in a presidential election year this year. And so, you know, at the federal level, that means that there's a few points in time where we expect legislation to potentially move. And other than that, everyone's back home campaigning, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's not just the presidential election, but all members of the House of Representatives and a third of the Senate and almost all state representatives are up for re-election to you. So, There's a lot of that political campaigning focus, but there's also some really key health opportunities this year that we're closely keeping an eye on. So first, every year Congress needs to pass appropriations, which is how they fund the federal government. So the new federal fiscal year starts October 1, but in this big presidential year, that budget timeframe will probably get pushed a little bit and we'll be looking at what does that funding look like probably through the fall? So there are some opportunities there. That includes things like federal funding for research through the National Institutes of Health and some other really core programs that are really 
helpful and supportive for people with MS. So that's something that we're closely watching. There's two other healthcare policy issues that are getting a lot of attention that we think have some opportunities probably closer to the end of the calendar year. But you can't sort of raise your voice and tell Congress what you want them to do enough. And those are telehealth, which we've talked about a little bit. So making sure that some of those expansions we saw with telehealth with the COVID pandemic really stay in place. So that accelerated telehealth so much and really showed us that it's a good, viable option for people to be able to receive health care. And not only does it help if you're in a rural area and trying to reach a specialist like with MS, but for so many people with MS, telehealth is really promising because they don't have to manage through the fatigue or travel or those things we talked about with people traveling two hours to see you, right? So right. it just is really a great way for people with MS to get the care they need. And it's up to the person with MS and their healthcare professional to decide if telehealth is the right thing for that particular visit. And then the last thing that we're really closely watching is pharmacy benefit manager reform, which is also called PBM. There's been a lot of bipartisan agreement that something needs to happen with PBMs. And it gets a bit complicated, but PBMs are essentially the middleman between the pharmaceutical companies and someone's health insurance. And so actually a lot of policies and access that really affect how someone and if someone can get their prescription medications sort of come down to PBMs. And so there's a lot of attention on them right now. We're looking at things like increased transparency, a more open look into their practices so we really understand what's happening and opening up some of the access barriers that people with MS and others have faced. So the end of this calendar year, we're looking at federal appropriations, telehealth, and pharmacy benefit manager reform. Wow. Those are big ones. Those, yes. those are big deals. <laughs> wow. And I'm assuming the MS Society will keep us posted on their website or how, does, how do we stay in touch with these policies? Yeah. So the best way is to stay in touch. I'll share two. So one is that signing up for our MS Activist Network, and you can do that through the website. And then the second is there's an MS Activist account on X. And so we'll post some updates and information. And if we have active action alerts, it will get posted there as well. So those are the two best ways for people to follow along and stay in contact on our policy issues. Awesome. I will put those in the show notes. And one final question that I have for you, because this came up recently and I was surprised at how many people didn't know this existed, is the MS Navigator. Can you tell us, for those that don't know what it is and how to use it? Yeah, absolutely. So MS Navigators are a great resource from the National MS Society. And Navigators are really there to partner with people affected by MS along their MS journey in any way that they need. You know, we're constantly learning and evolving at the MS Society. And one of our new changes to MS Navigator is appointment-based scheduling. And so that's really exciting because People affected by MS can reach out and schedule an appointment, and then they can have a more um, in-depth conversation with an MS navigator at a time that's convenient for them. So, you know, again, I hear people talk a lot about their complaints with the healthcare system, and one of the top things people say is, it's a full-time job, and I spent an hour on hold, or I can only call during my lunch hour. And so we want to make sure that we're not a barrier for people with MS getting what they need. And so MS Navigators moving to this appointment-based model really are better able to serve people with MS in the way that works best for people with MS. That's awesome. And if I'm not mistaken, you can really ask anything. Like if you're needing guidance with healthcare or your health insurance, or even if you're looking for mobility aid or you need modifications to your home, it's it's pretty all-inclusive, right? Absolutely. So navigators really are there to be that partner along anything that may come up in someone's MS journey. So maybe it's exploring home modifications talking through disclosing your MS in an employment setting and understanding your rights and responsibilities there. 
It could be health insurance, thinking about some of the changes that we've been talking about with Medicare to better understand that. Or it could be someone who has more in-depth needs and, and needs more support and navigators can work with someone through that as well. It's so cool to see the MS Navigator program because I remember being at a lecture before it existed. I don't remember what date this was, but it was just kind of mentioned in passing like, hey, this is something that we're brainstorming and thinking about, but it hadn't launched yet. And it seemed like an amazing resource back then. And it's so cool to see how it's progressed throughout the years. It's truly invaluable. It's a wealth of information. So I would encourage anyone listening who has any question at all where you're looking guidance for guidance, reach out, go to, how, how would someone reach an MS navigator? That's probably a good next question. Yeah. I mean, and we even think about the society's website as a first step along that navigator journey, right? Cause like you said, there's a lot of information and resources there. So people can sort of self-serve if that's what they want, just go to our website and find the information that you're looking for. There's a live chat feature on our website too. So people can just pop in there if they have a quick question. Even if it's something that's not a quick question, you can get it started there and a navigator will help guide you for next steps. And then there's information on the website too, both for the phone number and how to schedule an appointment right there. Awesome. And I'll put the links for that in the show notes as well. Great. This has been so insightful. It's it's a topic that is so important, especially this time of year, as especially in an election year as well. But it's just so important to know what's going on, stay up to date with all of that. So thank you so much for sharing your insights and expertise with us. Well, thanks, Gretchen. It's been a great conversation. Mm-hmm. 